Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. On the campus of Central Washington University, I'm your host, Nick Zetner. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoy our topic, and I am sure that you will enjoy our guest. You already know who our guest is. There's no guest in the guest today, baby. Basil will be joining us shortly. The local time is 1.49, I'm going to say, give or take, 1.49 p.m. And we will begin session Y called Orogenic Collapse, what, at the top of the hour, at 2 o'clock local time. That's Pacific time. So that's about 10 minutes from now, and I'm uh, live with, uh, I don't know, I guess 300 people or something like that. So uh, we'll have people trickle in, and we'll say hi, and we'll just make sure that we're doing okay and everything else. I already see a bunch of 5 by 5s uh, so that's great. I don't even have to ask now. Come on, this is this this thing is a, is a, this ship be driving itself at this point. Uh, terrific. So thanks for the report. Let me get a little sip of water here, and we will uh, start saying hi to folks. I should start now. My God, they're already going by. Slurp fast, boy. Dakota is in as Australia. Dakota is in Australia. Mardine's in Richland, Washington. Talk about Norley, yeah, she's uh, at the beach, tropical beach in uh, Panama. Itchyboots.com, do yourself a favor. I'm scrolling back, I already saw a bunch of stuff, but yes, where are you viewing from and can I say hi? And we'll, I got one quick thank you, but I don't think it'll take long. Uh, Garrett, the Dutch night owl from the Netherlands. Amy uh, says, good afternoon, Nick and Basil. Yeah, oh, you know what? No, I kind of like playing tricks on myself. I'll email Basil in a couple of minutes. He's probably with a student anyway. Peter's in Bangor, Maine. James is in Selah, Washington. Phil's in Mankato, Minnesota. Loud and clear, thank you for that. Uh, Dwight's in Springfield, Illinois. I'm, I'm back a ways. Bruce is in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I'm kind of taking my time, I don't know why. Dennis is in Ottawa, Canada. Polly's in Kansas City. Is that Missouri or Kansas? Uh, I'm scrolling, uh, uh, you know, I'm in control now. I'm scrolling, uh, creeping towards uh, live. Patrick's in Rochester, no automatic scroll, now I'm live. I've lost control. <laughs> Bo's in uh, Ebolok, Denmark. Hello, Bo. Good often. Good, good, good evening. Good evening. Oh, God. W. Hopkins in uh, Point Richmond, California. Hi. Jao Santos from Portugal. Hello, Jao. Thank you for joining us today. Ian's in Melbourne, Australia. Pick it up, boy. Francis is in Winterville, Georgia. Anthony's in uh, Detroit, suburbia. Oh, yeah, Anthony the artist. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk a little Celestia today. Um, John's in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Jagurtha, Algeria. Hello, Jagurtha. Nice to have you back. Terry's in Bendigo, Australia. Yeah, these Wednesday afternoons work pretty well for you folks on the other side of the planet, I think. But what do I know? Robert is in Marion, uh, Marinette, Wisconsin. Jim's in Keweenaw. You, you, you. Oh my God, I'm having troubles reading. This is not a good sign. Kirk's in Yet the Boy, Sweden. That one rolls off the tongue. Jim's in West Bank, BC. Doug's in Clyde Park, Montana. Dennis in Jurassic Coast, Dorset, UK. Dennis, you're always with us. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Steiner Offensen from Bergen, Norway. Hello, Steiner. John, Joe, Peter from the highest part of the continental Netherlands. Stevie Pinhead checking in from the, the hip uh, neighborhood known as Fremont Ballard in uh, Seattle. Dan's from Upper St. Clair. Why am I having such a hard time reading today? My God. Claudia, Bavaria, Germany. That, that little uh, flag for your country uh, is eye-catching. Thank you for including that. That's a nice touch. Evelyn is in checking in from Nevada. Ernest is from Farmington, Connecticut. Okay, I do need to, I need to email Basil. 
He's not the nervous type, but I am. So give me a sec, would you? And then I'll do our quick thank you, which I've forgotten I had for weeks. I finally found it. And while I'm at it, let me make sure the... Uh, oh, we're up to about 500. Volume off of the second monitor. Off right. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, before I go back to the hellos... Um, Craig in Lakeville, Minnesota. Craig, I mean, it's been so long, I don't even remember what show it was or what the reference was. But apparently I was talking just off the cuff about Pokey and Gumby, or Gumby and Pokey, Gumbitty, for ages three and up. I qualify. So... Again, I, <laughs> I've lost track of what I've said in some of these shows, but it caught Craig's uh, ear, and so I guess this is a photo of, Craig, what is this? A photo of uh, your big screen TV or something, watching one of these shows, and then <laughs> you've got the roadside book of, uh, roadside geology book of Minnesota, I think, there, and uh, Gumby and Pokey. So let's, 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 uh, so thank you, Craig. Uh, let, let's get these uh, guys out. Let's let's un, uh, get these guys out of their box. I mean, Basil's maybe going to be uh, unleashed today. He's my. I have a sense things are going to get wild. You might have to buckle up today. It's going to be. I think it's going to be a very interesting show. So let's get these guys uh, unleashed as well. I don't know. What should I do? That's one thing we'll do. What what should I do with these guys? except just show them to you. And I guess if you're under 30, you're confused right now, but uh, some of us remember. I must have been talking about animation or something, and like claymation, or I don't even know what the right term is for this. But God, we were desperate watching stuff like this on a, I think it was a Sunday morning. So thank you, Craig. That kind of works. Core is in Middleburg, the Netherlands, where it's 103 kilometer per hour winds. Oh, you got a storm there in the Netherlands. Okay, well, you guys hang on tight now. Um, K, K, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna share your gift uh, next time. Thank you. I've been holding on to that gift as well. Let me scroll back and say hi to a few more. We only have a couple minutes. The guest is in the green room for you nervous types. We're good. We're good. He had his mask on, so he must have been dealing with students. I mean, we still got masks all over here as well. Please leave, the, please leave your comments out of it, please. Please, please. Um, yeah, why did I even mention that? It was dumb. Cheryl, uh, Aberdeen, Washington. Kanata, Ontario. Hello. Jackson, Louisiana. West Michigan. I'm down to live, I guess. Calgary, Alberta. Hi, Peter. Gatineau, Quebec. Hello, Michelle or Michael. I'm not sure which one. Uh, there's uh, starting to snow in Colorado. That sounds romantic. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I don't mean anything by that, Chris. Uh, Catherine, hello. Cecilia in Garnett, Kansas. Y'all? Daryl's 68 degrees in uh, southeast Kansas. It's 52 degrees here Fahrenheit, man. Denise has a con now it's a now it's a, a competition to put the country's flag into the comments. I kind of like that. Denise is in Japan and she has her Japanese flag. Rockland, California. Quilcene, Washington. Sunny Northwest Nevada. Great Falls, Montana, it's been snowing there all day, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Well, I have a little more than one minute, 
And uh, as always, I want to thank you for joining us for this session. Here's to you for your continued interest and your regular attendance. Got about 600 watching at the moment. We will start our session in one minute. Thank you. Hot mic. Okay, it's going to be loosey-goosey today, more so than normal. You're okay with that. The guest is okay with that. We have to listen carefully to the guest. Don't be distracted. Listen to those words and follow what he's talking about. Occasionally interject, translate for the audience, or somehow. But that's going to be the, the heart of this show. It's not going to be you. It's going to be our guest. And you don't know 90% of what the guest is going to say. So you're just going to have to kind of get ready to flow. You can do that. So your part is also loose. What is your order? You have an iPad that appears to be functional. You're not going to go there right away, though. You're going to, go, you're going to start with old greenie and do the same old themes over and over again. Old greenie first. Then iPad? Is there a reason to go to the second board before you go to the iPad? You share the emails. Do you go to the emails first? I guess we should have thought of this before, huh, boy? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure you'll figure something out. You'll figure something out. You'll figure something out. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to this session. We're talking about something called orogenic collapse today. You might have to Google that one. Maybe you already have. Orogenic collapse, what the hell? I thought I, thought I was kind of feeling good about what we're learning and now you throw a title at me, I got no idea what you're talking about. And collapse, that sounds kind of negative. Do we need to be all negative? I thought this was a positive kind of inclusive place. You're talking about collapse, that doesn't sound fun. Economic collapse. My uncle Gene went down to the A&P, went to go down and buy some groceries. He collapsed in the checkout market, checkout line. Never saw him again. He collapsed. Why would we want to talk about collapse? Why would we want to talk about collapse? Why? Session why? 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 I think I want to start with one question. Why? It's not just me. A bunch of you have been emailing me. You know, I get a bunch of emails. I read them all. I can't reply to them all. A bunch of you are saying, you're running out of letters. Why is all this extension happening? It's like the elephant in the room, isn't it? Why is it extending? Would you please get to that? Are you stalling? This is, I'm adding now, I'm embellishing what you're saying by email. Are you, are you stalling because you don't know? Well, I thought I had an idea. But our guest today is going to help us expand our mind and expand our scope. And what once was a Northwest story, I think I'm starting to see, but I don't know. I don't really know exactly where we're going with Basil. But I think we're going to be much broader than we have been. And this will get us to our last session. Yes, our last session is Saturday morning at 9 a.m. with the Dream Team. We will be focused and locked into the North Cascade specifically, but we'll see where we go with Basil today. I might take some, some themes and ideas from Basil and go right to the Dream Team on Saturday and uh, see what they have to say. <laughs> I have no idea how, how wild it's going to get today, but 
kind of looking forward to it. So before we get to the wildness, which I think will be there, let's go ahead and, and uh, kind of snuggle up to some com comfortable ideas. Stumbled on that. Do I have some intimacy issues? I don't know. It seems like I've been doing the same thing on Old Greeny every show, doesn't it? And this is pretty much what we've been saying. But I think it's important to lay it out yet again today. And for all I know, I'll do it with session Z as well on Saturday morning. Between 100 million years ago and 53 million years ago, we have the Rockies building. We are thickening the crust up to maybe 60, maybe 65 kilometers thick. I have no idea how wide a zone that is in the American West. But with the rocks we've been looking at, and with the North Cascades in particular, Stacia Gordon, a bunch of stuff, apparently we've got that extra thickened crust, at least locally here in the North Cascades. That's a compressional story, and we had two rounds of magmatic flare-ups during this green time. I don't even have the dates. You know them. I don't even maybe remember them. The first magmatic flare-up in the North Cascades, I'm guessing 96 million years ago to 87. Does that sound right? And the second one is like 80 million years ago to 67. Correct me. Come on. This is, this is your time to correct me in the live chat. But the point is we have two major magmatic flare-ups the first bigger in volume than the second, but they're happening apparently during this compressional time. And I know that we have visited multiple sessions. Daddy's getting excited. Okay, I, I, was, I thought this would be a slow build. It's not. I'm full throttle right now. I'm yelling. We know this part has not been just local. Because we were in the frickin' Rocky Mountains with Caleb Scarberry and Dave Rogers and, and even Tecla Harms for a while. I say even because we weren't really talking about the Rockies at that time. But we were quite a ways far inland, inboard as it's called, with this study of terrains and things. So, you know, that's been a major learning point for me, maybe for many of you as well, that the Rockies started to build 100 million years ago. They shut off, whether it's severe or laramide style, thrust faulting, shortening the crust, thickening the crust. But that was a regional story. That was much of the West. That's why I got excited just there. I hadn't thought about it till right now talking to you. This is not just, this is more than just a Pacific Northwest story before 53 million years ago. We've been doing it. I, did, I guess I got excited because I didn't even realize it till right now that we've been doing this regional story with our crustal thickening. And I think the main question today is why do we suddenly have extension? But I think the other major question tied to that is how regional is the extension? If the collision and the thickening goes from the true west coast of North America as far east as, as Wyoming or, or Colorado, and yeah, I've got one of the green, uh, one of the boards with a bunch of white lines on it with a much different scale, a much wider scale than we've had before. Is this a regional story too? Oh, I wasn't planning on this, but I think I like that. Okay, let's try it. Let's try it. I'm spitballing. Oh, boy. Yep. Okay. Oh, boy. This is a risk. Do I go this? Yep. Why not? So I'm going to come to this map a fair amount now and also when we go to Basel. Because instead of just looking, remember last time we were looking at metamorphic core complexes with Jerome Lessman, and we were looking at uh, those core complexes on, the, on, the, uh, on both sides of the border, southern, southern British Columbia and northeastern Washington. The shoe swap was our main story. And I was asking questions of how much, and you're like, I can't see, I can't see. That's the point. You can't see because it's all just basically here, the size of my pinky fingernail. And I was asking how much of that is tied to the North Cascades. I, I'm, not, I'm not moving very much on this map. It's a neighborhood story. Okay, now I'm really freelancing. Maybe I'm going to be one that's all over the place. Maybe our guest is going to be like bringing me back down. Damn, I didn't see this. I'm freewheeling because 
Last winter, with the exotic terrains, one of the main messages that I had throughout that series, the exotic terrain series A to Z, again, that's more than a year ago now. One of the things I kept saying was, I don't really understand the exotic terrain complications if I just look in Washington. I can't, I can't see it. There's too many pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in the North Cascades and my first 20 years of trying to sit down and learn about Mount Stewart, I'm pointing to it right now, just north of our campus, and other things in north central Washington, I was, I was just paralyzed. I just wilted. I, I couldn't keep the momentum going because I, I couldn't make sense of those relationships because I was just right here in this, this, this spot only. So the big leap for me, the huge help for me last winter this is all unplanned, by the way, but I, I just, I, I think it might work. I could finally see some th relationships in the North Cascades of Washington with exotic terrains if I went up to British Columbia. Do some of you remember this? Were you with us more than a year ago? I said, let's, let's leave. I'm confused here. Let's leave and look at the entire province of British Columbia and at least learn some basics up there because most of these major exotic terrains have not been buried or sliced or diced. Sure, they've been modified a bit, but you can see much of the terrain story north, and then let's come back to Washington. And then again, the exotic terrain series more than a year ago, we come back to Washington, and I want to leave again. And I would go down to Oregon and Idaho and California. We were down for a while. Remember, we had those field reports. That was kind of fun. So I think I have the same strategy, and I think I, ha I have had the same strategy with the compressional part of the story between 153 million years ago. We have been, earlier letters in this series, we have been through here. But I don't think we've been all through here with the extensional story. And so pink means... Magma, at least right now. And we have magmas that are Eocene in age, between 50 and 45 million years ago in the North Cascades. The Golden Horn, the Cooper Mountain, the Railroad Creek, one other one I can't remember, the Duncan Hill Pluton. But you've seen other versions of uh, the stuff I've holed up to the chalk, to the, to the, uh, camera, that we have these Eocene magmas, this was one of the major points, right? That we've had Eocene magmas, the Absaricas, the Lowland Creek, I'm not prepared now, I can't remember some of the names. But we had this incredible range, the Kamloops magmas last time, we said this isn't a nice, well-developed line of volcanoes. We, it, we're starting to see, and I think many are now seeing, that those chalice slash Kamloops Eocene magmas between 50 and 45 million years ago, or if you want, 53 to 40, I don't know, 43 million years ago, depends on where you are. These are the Eocene magmas, and they are so widespread. And the farthest east these things go is, 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 in, Easter, is in western South Dakota, not the Black Hills, but just north. It's hard to imagine how that's a simple subduction story from a subducting plate and making a beautiful volcanic arc. Hard to see that. So we've already done that part of it, but now here's my question. Oh, I like this. Don't get too pleased with yourself, boy. How about the other fireworks? Like, we have visited in this series that these chalice magmas extend far east of Washington. By the way, do they go down here? We haven't anybody help us. Do the chalice magmas, quote unquote, do the Eocene magmas in this age window, do they go south of Idaho? And if they do, do they stay in this time window? I think Basil's going to help us there. 
But I think what I want to do with this board here, and I'm going to go to the whiteboard in just a second, is how widespread are these other guys as well? The core complexes, we know that they're wide, but is the extension super wide? And then what's the main question today? Why? 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 Why all the extension if it's so widespread? He goes to the whiteboard that is preloaded. Didn't think I was going in that detour. Kind of like it. We'll see if it works uh, once we get to our conversation with Basil. So let me slow down for just a sec. This is a review whiteboard. So those that have been clamoring for a special session to just review all of our topics, I still don't think I'm doing that, but I'm, I'm giving it to you kind of here. Here's our craziness, including some kind of just little snapshots. Our metamorphic core complexes. Our geologic elevator rocketing to the surface. The crystalline core of the North Cascades. The magmas I was just talking about. Not just in Washington. Both plutons and volcanic rocks. And these basins that have strike-slip faults bounding them in many cases. The strike-slip faults begin to become active. The deposition within the sandbox becomes active. So is this craziness just in here or much wider spread? I've asked it twice. I don't think I'll hammer it anymore. You know what I'm saying now. Now, um, One little snippet. Last time we were talking about the Shushwap metamorphic core complex and saying that many of those core complexes that cross the border are kind of all part of a major structure called the Shushwap, and Jerome seemed to be okay with that. And once we were talking with Jerome, and Jerome was playing with his foam blocks, and we had two major grobbins, at least on the Washington side, the Republic grobbin and the Torado Creek grobbin. And I asked during the show to Jerome, do you, think, do you think these two grabbins that are in the main turtle back or the turtle shell of the Shushwap, do you think there's a strike slip component to those? Or do you think that they're just simple grabbins? Well, guess who was watching? Erin Donaghy. She's probably with us again. She's been a loyal viewer live with us. Erin, if you're watching again live, it's always a thrill to have you with us. So Erin emails um, so on Monday night, a couple nights ago, long email, very, very juicy email. I'll just basically cut to the main message that Aaron says. Uh, these two grabbins in northern Washington, and therefore presumably the grabbins that continue into southern BC, are purely uh, extensional. In other words, not much, maybe zero, trans tension or strike slip motion. But I'm sharing a portion of this very two -page, long two page email from Aaron Donaghy at Purdue University, who was in the show a couple, couple series uh, before Christmas. She was uh, with us twice. Aaron says, I think all of these sedimentary basins that are on this Shushwap or Okanagan nice dome country are forming as a consequence of extension. But as you work your way further west, as you work your way farther west, they become more and more strike slip. And she says, it's the faults that bound these basins that could possibly link to a regional detachment underground in some form, which would control the primary exhumation of the metamorphic core. Now, I know just enough about what Basil is going to talk about, where he's not only linking faults in the subsurface, but he's linking faults laterally as well. And you'll, you'll see what I mean in just a second. So Aaron's kind of in that neighborhood, without knowing it, that where we're going with Basil today. Okay, I've got to go to the iPad before I lose power. Uh, long story there, but let's try to get over there. Can we do it? We can. He's happy. 52 frickin' degrees. Craziness. Uh, do I want to get, make you sad? Or maybe happy? I don't know. Maybe you're happy. We're almost done. Thank God. 
I'm done with this guy. We only have one more show left. Please join us Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific, for the thrilling conclusion to this series. It will be all three members of the Dream Team talking about the North Cascades and their current grant. Um, go to nickzentner.com, a place where I have papers for you. As always, if we click on the word Eocene, I have four papers for you. One is a repost from the Caleb Scarberry Show. Caleb suggested that I read this paper back in the mid-90s from Constantius at the University of Arizona, talking about this collapse story. And then Jerome, in the last show, informed both Jeff Tepper and I about a uh, PhD thesis, and then this paper, I forget her first name, so let me go to it, Esther Bourdais at UBC, Vancouver, uh, interesting paper, and if you can get to the PhD, she's got some wild stuff, because one of her uh, uh, supervisors is Mitch Mahalanek, uh, tied to the Carr and Siglock scene, so there's, Jerome kind of got into it just a little bit in the last show, and I think both Tepper and I were like, What? <laughs> Westward subduction 60 million years ago? I don't understand. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm nowhere close to getting that. But look what we have here. We have a paper in press from Basil that he has generously shared with us. In other words, it's not published yet. And this is a different one than the other paper that he talked about before Christmas. So he's been a busy boy. And so you'll see this format looks different with the basal tick-off. I'm assuming it's going to be published this year, so I just said 2022. But there are pieces of the puzzle involving Basil's model in his mind that are available to you here. So this draft, or this whatever, final draft, uh, waiting for publication, uh, will not be going lockstep with Basil's discussion today, but there'll be parts there, and there will also be parts here from a paper that has been published, also brand new, 2022, by Alan Glazner. Many of you know that name. And look at this title. And look at the last sentence of his abstract. Ironically, the plate tectonics revolution nicely explains plate, te plate boundary magmatism in much of the world, but less successful in Western North America, where many of these links were first developed. It is time for a second revolution. Oh, my Lord. There's a call to arms here. What's going on? We'll talk to our guest about it, who's the sergeant at arms, apparently. I met, Gaze, uh, I met Basil. We'll leave Ellensburg. I met Basil in Idaho, I had to look it up, June of 2016. And I was on a field trip that was put together by Andy Buddington at uh, Spokane College. And we were all camping uh, near Whitebird, Idaho. And uh, it was a multi-day trip, Hell's Canyon and things of that nature. Let me get myself turned around here. 2D, 2D is oh, fine. And we all camped uh, in our little tents at uh, Hammer Creek Campground, right, right in the heart on the banks of the Salmon River. So I want to show you a few photos from that trip. And that was my first exposure to basil. And of course, I started asking basil questions around the campfire. And everything I thought I knew, I realized I didn't know. Like, you know, you remember my novel comment about the Sierra Nevada mountains in eastern California and that granite being identical to the granite of Idaho Batholith, which I'd clung to with pride. And within three minutes around the campfire, Basil's like chomping on some beef jerky. He's like, I don't know about that. I think uh, we got data now in the Idaho Batholith that says there's no connection to the, to the, uh, Idaho, uh, to the Sierra uh, Nevada. My point is, uh, it's one of those where you meet somebody who has deep knowledge and you just kind of get your thoughts messed up in a good way. And I'm hoping we'll get our thoughts messed up in a good way today. I'm building this up too much, but sorry, Basil. I'm excited for today, obviously. So to set the stage for a little bit more on the chalkboard, God, Daddy's running long. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Saw a black screen, didn't like that. Hang on, hang on, hang on, Patrick.
We're getting to my other main question, which I don't think I've enunciated really yet, but I'm going to try now. Here's from Jeff Tepper talking about the docking of Silesia, and especially before Christmas, we hammered this so hard that the docking of Silesia, the rustic sourdough, is docking around 50 million years ago, and all this fireworks, all these crazy things are happening inboard of the docking of Silesia. And since December, Jeff has, you know, changed his mind here. He doesn't think it's the cool anymore because of the Spencer Fuston show, etc. But the point is, Silesia accreting is a big deal. Now, this is from a geology underground or underfoot book by Dave Tucker, Bellingham, Washington. And these are his carefully created cartoons. And he's showing the insular superterrain docking 100 million years ago. And there it is, colliding with the coast mountain belt or the coast plutonic complex. But look at the size. Do I have my pointer? Look at Silesia. It's a freaking gumdrop compared to the size of Rangelia. So as we talk with Basil in just a few minutes, I want to try to get a sense of scale here. This is a new thought for me. Yes, Solezzi was a huge story and did have a tremendous impact on much of Washington's geology. But is it what? Is, is, is Silesia like 10 times smaller than Rangelia? 20 times smaller than Rangelia was before it docked? And we're kind of getting at the sense of why do we have extension when we dock Silesia? So a few pretty pictures and then I think we need to move on. So June of 2016, eastern Idaho. I long for these days. I can't wait for these days. Maybe you too. Just the weather, just the smells, just the everything. We're up in the Seven Devils Mountains. We're down to Hell's Canyon. We're along the Salmon River. We're at the eastern Idaho Shear Zone. And we're learning from the, the guys who have been doing the research. The guys and gals who have been doing the research for the last 20 years. And here comes Basil. Doesn't matter if we're in the campground or up on top of the mountain pass or in between. He's pulling out these huge posters. And Keegan Schmidt, who is also co-leading the trips, pointing out some of the same stuff. And there's no better way to learn this stuff. And again, this is six years ago. My first experience with basil. And again, my brain was scrambled. I thought I knew a few things. And, and as the hours go by, I get more and more confused. But again, in the long term, it's a positive experience. So I guess I'm warning you, dear viewer, that we've built some things together today. Not today. We've built some things together this winter. And I think this guy's going to blow up a few things for us. And we got to be willing to deal with a little bit of short-term pain for long-term gain. Because this guy has done a lot of thinking over 25 years plus involving not just Western Idaho, but much of the North American West. Okay, you get the idea. Can't wait for the next field trip. When are we going? Look at this guy. The latest dance moves. Good. Can I get back without freezing? Apparently, we unplugged the iPad. Uh, Basil, give me another five minutes. You knew that was coming. Another five to ten minutes, and then we'll come to you. Ready? Here we go. So, um, this was an improvisation. That was supposed to come late. So, let's keep it real fast-paced now. I didn't erase this from last time. Here's the metamorphic core complex. We're calling it the Shushwap, coming down through southern BC, entering into northern Washington, and then it disappears. And in the last show, I wondered how far south does the Shushwap extend? Does it go all the way down through eastern, Oregon, eastern Washington, even through eastern Oregon? Maybe our guest can help us. What's the connection here? What's the connection here? Et cetera. Oh, I almost lost it. I want to pick up the pace, but I don't want to crash the green board. 
I kept this as well. I was going to really milk it, but I'm not. I'm going to go fast. So these are the turtle shells. These are the core complexes that we've discussed over the last three shows, correct? Turtle shells. And the turtle shells are one of the four major crazy phenomenon that are popping up in the eosteen. All the relation, all because of crustal extension. Why are we having crustal extension when before we had the insular superterrain collide and it was all compression? I'm just doing it verbally with you. Right? Insular hits, it's a compressional story. Selexia hits, and it's an extension story? Why? And how do we know it's extension? That's what we've been busy with since January 1st. All this stuff is talking extension. So in addition to these features, which are pull the crust apart, emerge the turtle shell, you want to? Here's our chalice magmas. What else is on the list? Geologic elevator here, come up. How many other geologic elevators are there? I don't know. Are they, is this just another core complex? That was our question a couple of shows ago. And also, which I know will be a major theme of Basil's visit with us, can you tell what I'm doing now? I'm drawing strike slip faults. How many of the strike slip faults that are creating trans tension sedimentary basins are showing up as a result of the accretion of Silesia? In other words, how many strike slip faults were not there before 53 million years ago? And if there are some strike slip faults that maybe even have sedimentary basins older than 53 million years ago, why are they there? So again, I was going to milk it and build this all from scratch and go just lay all this stuff on top of each other. I'm essentially out of time. But the thing that I do want to do before I lose this board is this. Before, I, I didn't know where we were going with this series when I started in mid-November. And it truly was going show to show. But the only thing I really did know before we started back in November is that the accretion of Silesia was going to be the reason for almost all this craziness in the Eocene. And you remember that Jeff and friends and Michael in Janesville, Wisconsin, who actually have... I had to glue this together, tape it together. Vinman Province, what does it say here, Michael? Mountain of existential angst, I can't even pronounce that. What's it say down here? Future home of Igneous Heart University. Thank you. So this was created uh, in, in the right scale with all of this. And so we've been just hammering the idea that the accretion of Silesia is responsible for all of this. Before Christmas, boom, fireworks. Accrete 51 to 49, fireworks 49 to 45. And now we've been taking a tour of all these different fireworks happening inboard of the funking of Silesia. Our guest today Sent an email Sunday night from Basil Tickoff. Nick, I'm going to roll with whatever you want to do on Wednesday, but below is my idea. I can modify it as you see fit. I don't really have Silesia accretion built into my model. It's a big nothing burger as far as the interior extension is concerned. It's a big nothing burger. Two minutes, Basil, we come to you. So 
So here's the scale of Celestia for this map. And you're like, don't forget about, I didn't. Okay? Greater Celestia. So this is the scale of this thing coming in. It's even a little bit too big now that I see it. It's hitting. It's creating many of our things, including if you come back on Saturday, and maybe, Basil, you want to talk about these, we have an incredible family of extensional dikes that all trend northeast, southwest. You remember those shows. The Rocky Mountain Boys, others have been talking about these chalice age dikes. And are they tied to the accretion of Celestia slash Yakutat or not? You know what's going to happen here. Right? We dock Celestia and Yakutat together. But Aaron Donaghy's heading to Alaska with Mike Eddy this summer, and they're going to find Yakutat up there and look for sedimentary deposits that they know now is on top of, uh, that's younger than Celestia. They're going to find those same things up here and work out the chronology. Basil says this is a big nothing burger. Why? And how much bigger is this Eocene story with metamorphic core complexes and magnus? We go to Madison, Wisconsin. 235, not that bad. Could have been quicker. We'll do the best we can. What a luxury to have Basil with. And here he is. How are you today? I'm doing fine, Nick. Although I have to say, you kind of set me up on this one. <laughs> I did. You did. <laughs> well, let's start with that. What do you mean? Oh, no, it's, it's all good. It's just like, basically, I'm just going to confuse everybody. But that's okay, you know? I, I like that was not my That was not my intent. Seriously, no. Let's, 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 get, let's set it properly. This is... My experience with each show, with each series, where I think I have a couple things put together and then I get an email from whoever or I see a paper from whomever and I'm like, okay, that's not exactly what I thought it was. And it's all healthy and I'm trying to do that with our, student, our, our students slash viewers as well. So I'm, I'm totally uh, setting this up in the most positive way. I hope that you can see that. You're kidding, I, absolutely, I hope. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so I don't know where you want to go. I know you've got a few slides to share. Um, you know, we, we already know a little bit about your background, but actually, you know what? Let me, let me try something before we get into the details. Is, is it a coincidence or an accident that you've got two major papers in the, in the works, and there's a couple of these other papers that seem to be like revisiting these 50-year-old ideas? What's going on? That's actually a great question, Nick. Um, I think, again, different people, different things. For me, I think the big issue is with the paper I put online, it's not going to be immediately clear why that's so important. But for me, that was the last piece of the puzzle. So in other words, I, di I knew I didn't quite get it. I knew there was just something kind of missing um, in Idaho. And... In fact, in some ways, Idaho's never really kind of been put on into the Cordillera. Like, the Canadians have their thing, and they're like, oh, we kind of get it. It kind of holds together. Yeah. You're happy. Like, whole, all your entire last show was basically <laughs> North of the Lewis and Clark line. Right, right. And then we got uh, Tampa, who was great. And she was like, yeah, but I don't really go past the Snake River Plain that you have there. To the north and and the reason they're not doing it is it doesn't make any sense um right there's this separate thing it's an arc it's too far in it's and so for me the the last piece of the puzzle was that idaho western idaho and eastern oregon have rotated and they've made a major rotation and all of a sudden it clicked it's like got it i think i i could be wrong of course but that was the, it's like when you, everybody knows this, you do the, there's a piece of the puzzle, and as soon as you get that piece, 
the whole thing kind of falls into place. And that's what it was for me. I also think that there's an openness to talk about these things. I think there's a little bit of a loosening that people have talked about the paleomagnetic data for a while, but all of a sudden there's some detrital zircon that says, this is really weird. I mean, there's mm -hmm. stuff coming from all over that like there's, you know, the, the zircon signals in these basins are a little bit not what you'd expect. And I think that's loosened things up. And some of them have also supported this long range transport of the insular super train. Okay, well, there's a couple of things. Yeah, I, we're, we're going to get there to, to your slides and a few other things, but th there's a bunch you just said that really intrigues me. So number one, the paleomag's not a new technique, so that's been around 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I'm more interested in these new techniques or, re or data sets that we didn't have even 20 years ago. So would, what would you put under that category? So... Um, probably the detrital zircon. Daryl okay. Cowan talks about how important it, it could potentially be, and it's worked out that way. Okay. That there are some places that have unique ages. It turns out Idaho has this 1370, 70-ish, we'll just say, um, peak that you can find everywhere. It's in Southern California. It's in Alaska. It's like, what in the world are Alaska? is like all this Idaho zircon stuff doing it everywhere. Then there's other techniques you can do, which you can, it's called a tracer, so hafnium. On that same zircon that you know the age, you can use the hafnium signals, and those are kind of unique to particular places. So you have both the age and the tracer. And so those things are new, like the, like that, this idea that you could use hafnium and zircon to do these kind of, you know, where things are coming from. And then people just being like the Sauer et al. study that um, Stacia Gordon was involved in and a bunch yeah. of other people saying, yeah, you know, look, this sure looks a whole, you know, the the schists, the Nices and the Cascades look a whole lot like stuff in Southern California. And they're being deposited at the same age. And they have the same um, zircon signals. And, and what's weird is, of course, there's stuff way up north in Alaska that John Garver and Cam Davidson have worked on that have exactly the same. So, like, yeah. thumbs up. Well, this is a sneak freak, of course, to starting this coming November, where we spend next winter talking about Baja BC. So we're going to partition what we can, uh, some of this. Um, but some of this new data you're just talking about, the hafnium and the, and the, the zircons are helping with this story, uh, what we're talking about today. And how about uh, a whole nother data set of the, all this tomography stuff, like this U.S. array? Was that a huge, are we reaping the benefits of that 10 plus years later? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the U.S. array was this moving broadband seismometers. And what's interesting is they were on a spacing of um, about 70 kilometers. You can't see the crust on that. I mean, basically, you can see where the bottom of the crust is, but it's not enough resolution. But you could see into the mantle. So a lot of the tomography work that Spencer's talked about, that um, Karin's talked about, is basically built off those, um, that, the results from that. But in addition, there was a big study in Idaho um, that I was involved in that was working on what is the boundary of, I of the Western Idaho shear zone to the accreted Blue Mountain strain look like, and it goes straight down. We know that now, it just basically goes straight down. That, um, that was your big your big poster that you had in the campground, right? Exactly. That was that cross section, right? But there was a really nice study done in the Bighorn Mountains in um, Wyoming to basically say why did we think those uplifts, and that was a very nice group of people working on those. And so all of that is sort of um, sort of putting together views we have of trying to tie more of the mantle to the crust and what's going on. And so yeah, the Earth um, scope effort was. Uh, was a big help in a lot of this. And one more, and then we'll go to your slides. So the Glazner paper that you sent me, that's another data set. I'm not even familiar with, is it an acronym or something, talking about a kind of a database of all these magmas or something across the West? Right, so what people are realizing is before it was like individual people like trying to hold all of this mess in their heads. <laughs> and we, right, so it's like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, right. And there's some people who are like amazing. They're like, they can tell you exactly, you know, that rock. Is <laughs> it's crazy, right? But, um, but now there are databases, and that's what Alan Glasner did in his really nice study. He looked at the Earth Chem database where people have agreed to like collaborate and, and look at um, data all over to look at sort of regional patterns. Yeah. 
So we have all of that. You know, the one thing I would like to say, though, is like we did all this work, right? And the piece of the puzzle that is the rotation piece, right? This is like the thing for me that clarified it. That was because we had three extra days and a drill in the back of the car. <laughs> it was like nothing that was planned. It was just like the, you know, we've got to be in Washington State at this time. We might as well just go do this. It was like the biggest accident. And it's just like that's how science works. Sometimes you just don't know. Well, let's go there. So just with your personal uh, history with Western Idaho, some of those techniques and that data was not there when you started 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Absolutely. And so, so part of it was you were new to the area or new to the ideas. You were just getting started. Uh, how much of that would you have? So you feel like you've kind of put this puzzle together with the model you're going to share with us. I promise we're going there. Uh, but how much of that was you would have figured out anyway, kind of well, with, with what you were doing 20 years ago? Right. So I think this is the thing that a lot of people working in Canada and a lot of people working in California, including myself, and then there was just this hole. And so it's not just me, right? There's Reed Lewis at the Idaho Survey, um, Keegan Schmidt's done a great job, Paul Links with the Detroit Zircon, Dave Foster working on the Bitterroots, right? There's a whole bunch of people who spent a whole lot of time in the last 20 years, like trying to figure out. And like we've all, you know, it's like you've just got little pieces. Yeah, and it's and now there's like there's almost enough now to kind of put it together. Well, we can't wait any longer. I've, I've held us an extra ten minutes, kind of getting this backstory. But come on, we got to get into it. So, how would you like to proceed? Would you like to just describe uh, the model you have in your mind? Would you like to feed off of what we've been doing in the series, or should we start with your slides and kind of go from there? Let's just start with the slides, and then I'd like to make sure that we get to people's questions too. Of course, you bet. Good. Well, we practiced yesterday. Let's see how we do here. We might get this weird thing right at first, but then I'll switch That's it right. up. That's okay, right. Here we go. Oh, this is exciting. A, a record third appearance from one guy. He must be good. Or something. He is good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Everybody was waiting, a asking, can we get this guy back? I still don't see your shared screen, by the oh, way. Oh, that's bad, Nick. Okay, let's keep trying. Okay, okay, I got it. I know what happened here. I have to press that one. Now you should. Do you have it now, Nick? No, I don't. Let's see now. Let's just take it. Take a second. So you went down to the share button and you shared your entire screen, I think. Correct and nothing is happening. If that's true, we'll try once more, and if nothing's happening, maybe we'll have you log out and log back in. We can do that. Okay, I did it one more time. So I could try and share just the video. I, I think we called this Daryl Cowan style before. Um, there, okay, now I got something. Does that it's, work for you? It's, it's, it's black, though. It's, okay. It's, Black. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, I can log back on. Let me do that. Let's try that. Okay. okay. Be right back. We'll see you in a second. Okay. Well, um, we're good. And I want to re nail down the two things we're trying to do. Why are we extending the crust when we're accreting Celestia? that we didn't have that with Rangelia and friends. And then the second thing is, how, uh, why is Celestia not uh, answering so many other uh, observations that we can make across the West? So he's back, ladies and gentlemen. We'll try this again. We'll go to plan B if we just can't get it to work. Be a shame, though. You put some time into those slides. That's fine. That's how things I go. I don't get it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Go to window again. We'll go to PowerPoint. Oh, now I've got, I've got. Uh, yeah, let's let's bring it in. But I don't see anything shared yet. I just see infinity. Yeah, hold on. I think that could be okay. And then, does that work? I'm afraid it's black. 
Okay, that's not what good. What the heck? Um, all right. All right. Do you let's let's try this. Let me just interact with the audience for a second. I'm going to hide you. Let me just uh, answer a few questions just to kill time and see if you can kind of think of something that maybe you're not able to connect with. I think what I'll do is I'll shut, I'll just do a computer shutdown and get back on. Sounds good. Okay. All, All right. right. See ya. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, I'm going to keep these on. Uh, you know, Basil's got an old computer. I remember we tested it once, and and uh, he had to restart his whole system. So let's. Let, what else do I have here? Did that. Did that. Did that. Yeah. Let's go back to this. And I'll read you another passage from Aaron's email. And Spreading Ridge John, you're going to be pleased with this if I can find the email. Here it is. So I'll ask the question one more time now that you can see this. Remember, this is a, this is a Rangelia accretion story, insular superterrain, which I want to get Basil's answer once he comes back to us. Can we, has anybody tried to compare the total volume of what is known today as insular superterrain compared to the acreage of the greater Seletia, Seletia slash Yakutat. But many of you were asking if this is a if this is an accretion making collision makes sense, but if we have the same kind of accretion, even if it's smaller, why are we extending? That's really the main, one of the main things we're trying to do here today. Here's Aaron. Uh, Aaron says, to summarize basin formation and tectonic setting for these basins, think of it like this. We collide the insular and thicken the crust. And then 53 to 48 million years window, we collide Seletia and also have a slab window or windows beneath the Cordillera because Seletia slash Yakutat is a ridge-centered oceanic plateau. So we can't forget about the spreading ridge. This is Aaron. These slab windows act like blowtorches beneath this overthickened crust, which definitely helps lead to some extension. So in Aaron's worldview, and I guess that must mean Mike Eddy's worldview is we're getting extension, at least in part, mainly, maybe mostly, because of these flare-ups that are acting like a blowtorch. We have our slab window underplating the crust. We'll see. All right, let's see. Oh, you look like a new man. I can tell. You've got a rebooted computer. All right, let me see. I'm going to share. There we go. I, we might. This looks promising, Basil. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Now can we go full? Uh, I'm hiding you again. Can you get that full before I bring you in? Do you remember how we did that? Uh, yeah, okay. I can try that. So... Um. Yep. <laughs> I'm getting greedy because I want to see those nice and big. Email from Chris Mattinson. Come on, Chris. You're not watching that show live upstairs? Okay. I have it big on my screen. We are perfect now. We are perfect now. Thank you. And occasionally I'll interrupt you and then we'll just go back to you can see me. But I know you can't see me right now. But this is wonderful. Please, I can. please proceed. Okay. Well, so the problem with what I was going to talk about, I was going to have to arm wave all over the place because the maps show things so much better um, yeah. than if I just tried to talk about it. Oh, no. So <laughs> no. hopefully we're back. We're back. Yep. Okay. So one of the things we talked about last time was that we have all this extensional deformation, and it seems to be Again, it's kind of a really sharp time, about 53 to 50 
five million years. And we were talking about things like the Okanagan and the shoe swap. And there's just this whole suite of things up here. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that there's a whole another suite of core complexes, but there's definitely a jump in them. They have moved further east. And this LCL line is really the boundary that separates them. So that's the Lewis and Clark line. Huh. So that I, I talked about it last time, and now it's coming back again. There we go. Uh, is the big separation. So you talked about whether this extension, I mean, because it's big. We know that the crust is extended. The numbers vary, but it's like 90 kilometers mm -hmm. of extension, right? So you have to open a 90-kilometer corridor. But we have little bits and pieces down in the Blue Mountains, and we don't see anything down there. In fact, oh. the mountains look just like normal. I mean, they don't look like anything's happened since actually before they collided, so before 100 million years ago. It's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. But this area, so the Bitterroot and then the Pioneers, really are going at exactly this time. So there's, got, there's a connection here. So to me, the Eocene is all about magmatism, and it's about core complexes, but it's also about strike-slip faults. Because we see this pattern over and over again, where you can kind of make a step but where we usually see it is in the oceans, in transform faults. So now, <laughs> I've taken an example. This is from the Cane area. So this is between South America and Africa in the Pacific Ocean. Here are transform faults. Uh -huh. And then there's mid-ocean ridges, and we know they're extending. Yeah. But between the areas that extend, you have to have an active fault, right? Because the material where my cursor is, is moving out to the west. But if you jump across the transform fault, it's moving out to the east, mm -hmm. right? Yep. But you can separate a big zone of extension from a zone of extension by having an active transform fault. And in this case, it's a right lateral one because, again, you're spreading to the north further out towards the west. And that is exactly, I think, what's going on at 53 million years as oh, you're wow. basically switching from the Okanagan Chuswap Kettle, you're going on this major strikes of fault, and you're separating out the Bitterroot and Anaconda, and then the pioneers to the south. So I have to say, this is David Foster and others' idea. This is a field guide that they published in 2000. No, it's a, it's a paper you know, in 2005. And I think okay. that they basically nailed it, that this is what's going on. This is why... The core complexes in Canada are further out to the west, and the ones in North America, in Lewis and Clark South, are off to the east a little bit. Can I interrupt you? Of course. And I want to have us continue to look at these two maps, so I'm going to do it even though you can't see me. I hope it's okay. Of course. Um, the tendency is to try to... So it sounds like I'm going to ask a question on behalf of the viewers, but I'm really asking for myself as well. I, I want to restore those things. I see those things all offset, those four gray, five gray blotches. Were they ever lined up as one big gray, gray line at some point? No. Just like the mid-ocean ridges were never lined up. You want to line them up, but they were never together. How do we know that? Aha! Aha! Failure. This is the importance of failure. The mid-continent rift up where I am yeah. has transform faults already initiating, even though the continent never broke apart. And the transforms are offsetting the areas of spreading. We know that those transform faults occur on North America. They're part of the rifting process. Huh. So you can never, right? You do. You want to say, oh, this was one thing and it's been offset. But right. if you do that, notice that you'll get the opposite sense of motion, right? If you gonna, put one yeah. mid-ocean ridge next to the other, it would have to move sinisterly. Mm -hmm. But you can go look at this, and you can go look at the Lewis and Clark zone, and you realize at this time, we'll get back to that, at right. this time, it's right lateral. Well, that is staggering and, and elegant, and... So the Lewis, the Lewis and Clark fault zone uh, is cutting through these five gray blotches? Or w how That's does the Lewis and Clark fault zone fit into this? So the Lewis and Clark, remember, so you got to take on the whole enchilada. 
right? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's so, what I'm talking about. The Lewis and Clark fault zone separates the Canadian collision from the Idaho collision. They're different collisions. And the Lewis and Clark zone is sinistral in the late Cretaceous and Paleocene. It only turns right lateral in the Eocene. So this fault's doing one thing at 55. It's like you mm. blow a whistle and it heads the other way at 53. <laughs> okay. So the Bitterroot and Anaconda were always on one side. The Priest River was always on the other. The Clearwater is the interesting one because it's kind of stuck in the middle. It doesn't know kind of which way to go. So it's very localized, and it seems to be bounded by strikes of faults. Oh, my then, God. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm getting too excited. I'm, I'm cutting in too much. You've got more slides, so please proceed with kind of the, the way you've laid this out. But this is so exciting, Basil. So... Um, so, right, so we have this early history, the Lewis and Clark doing one thing, going left lateral, pushing all of Idaho into North America, well, not, mm -hmm. at least western Idaho and eastern Oregon, and that little corner of Washington. In. So, I also wanted to say, if, if you look at this, and I, I got Christian to send me a couple pictures, because I thought, you know, the Thor Odin Dome is just so spectacular when oh, you go yeah. look. And wow. you look at the migmatites. So these are the melted rocks. And these rocks are 55, 53, 50 million years old. Yeah. You can see them. And they're just what's coming up as a result of this big extension that's going on. And this, again, this extension is like 90 kilometers of extension. So that's up north. But if you jump across and you go to the Bitterroot Anaconda, it's the same thing. It's basically these big, you can see this slope. Um, you can see the Milanite zones, and when you make estimates of the Bitterroot and the Anaconda, and you have to throw in the Phillipsburg as well in there, you get about 90 kilometers too. Huh. So it's, in fact, the same extension on one side as the other. So that explains why the German chocolate cake isn't really hot. I would love for those Columbia River results not to be there in some sort of <laughs> deep way. But they're not hiding this story. They're not hiding... Uh -huh story they're hiding the Cretaceous story interesting okay so anyway so that's sort of one thing I wanted to talk about good the other thing I wanted to talk about was sort of how does this all kind of connect to the south because we have core complexes down in the pioneer we have them down the raft rivers and if you go south of the raft rivers you have in the snake range and so like how does that all connect yeah so, um, this is from Alan Glasner's paper, and I, I like what he did because he just said, here's the data. Here's all the data I have. And if you look yeah. at 50 to 55 to 50 million years ago, you get this magmatic, you get magnetism all over here, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, there's some weird stuff going on in the North Cascades, for sure, that looks like this um, spreading center, subducting um, spreading center issue. Yeah, yeah. But that can't be the whole story. Right, right. Because there's way too much out here. I mean, it's in South Dakota for crying out loud, right? So, but there's also another pattern here. And if you look, you realize, oh yeah, there's a big blob in Idaho. That's the chalice, the chalice flare up between yeah. again, 53, 45. Mm -hmm. But then it sort of starts tracking south. You lose it, right? The Snake River Plain is covering a lot of stuff, but it's kind of moving south <laughs> through time. So there's a pattern, and this is the pattern of magmatism. But what's interesting about that pattern of magmatism is the extension is following it. So it's like the magmatism moves to northern Nevada, oh. and the extension moves to northern Nevada. They're coupled. So let me pause, and let me... Uh... So Tekla was careful two shows ago to separate the discussions. I wanted to talk about all these core complexes from Washington down to Arizona. And she says that Snake River Plains, a big distinction. And I think she said it's an Eocene extension story up here. And then she said it's a Miocene story south of Southern Idaho, kind of 20 or 18 or something like that. But you're adding Glasner's dates where it's it's not all based in range. There is an age progression from 40, 30, 20, and younger. Is that true? Yes, that is that is true. And then again, the data the databases show you that that's the case. And it's just a matter of, of knowing, 
right. that. And it's right. so the magmatism story is get is what's shown here, but the extension story also starts in the north. It's an Eocene extension, as Tepo said, in the north, but it's sort of Eocene to Oligocene by the time you get down into central Nevada. So it's like it's following it down. And that's because well there's a there's a couple different reasons why that's happening. The one of the major reasons is Idaho is really high. I mean, and Tekla oh. kind of said this in a way as well, which is basically comes down to the taller they come, the faster they fall, right? <laughs> Little Jimmy Cliff there. They, they, just, you know, they just, if they're tall, they're going to collapse right away, right? And so Idaho we know, I mean, we know Idaho is high. It's got deep rocks, but it's also shedding detritus off everywhere. So we know that stuff is coming off of there. And it Behold, makes... Yeah. Yep. So am I visualizing a Tibetan plateau that's high, or am I imagining uh, some sort of monster volcanic arc that's more linear? Oh, that's a great question. So the Altiplano is what people usually like to talk about. So it's the Altiplano is kind of linear. I mean, it bends a little bit, but it's basically, it's, uh, it's a strip. And so this is probably what we're talking about. But even within that strip, there are places that are going up faster and places that are going up slower. Of course, if you go up too fast, the erosion keeps up because you glaciate it. Um, so the place that's probably going up is, is again, this, this sort of corner in Idaho because everything's kind of pinned there. But it's but it there is a strip basically that's going south and ba the magmatism actually let me you're you're leading perfectly into another point. Thank you. So, can I go there? Please. Okay. So. Of course, of course, we're back to you. Oh God, yes. So we have this thing. Idaho sticks out a little bit too much, right? Which is the point, and then it gets pushed in. There we go. <laughs> okay, so you're pushing it in. This is why the Lewis and Clark zone is probably left lateral at this time, up to 60, and then it it becomes right lateral as it connects the core complexes. Mm. But the point is that there was this high area, and we know that because it's two micas. These are the kind of granites you generate when you thicken the crust and you basically start melting it because of radioactive heating, basic crustal thickening heating hmm. in it. So the, you can only get two micas when you have that much aluminum around. And this belt comes through just like this, right? And so here's the critical part. If you look at where that two mica belt is, so this is the plateau. It's called the Nevada Plano when it's in Nevada. It went through Idaho. It snuck into British, southern British Columbia. It actually goes down to northern Mexico, so we know that we know that, and it's you know is that linear? Well, it's kind of linear. Um, and the the magmatism is going to follow that trend. Actually, I'll just go down here. There it is. Look at that. So, look at that. Ellen Nelson was really nice to sort of summarize Alan's work into a figure. I love where, it. Yeah, so you can see it's it's up here, and then it's here at 50 to 45, and then it's sort of this broad zone, and then here and here. But an important point is that's where it is now. But remember, this area got elongated in the Eocene or the Oligocene, so it's it's already it's wider than it should be, and then it gets widened again by the basin and range because the basin and range also pulls it apart. So at any one time, it's actually, it's like a cannonball. That's how Alan Glasner described it to me once. It's like a pipe that's basically coming up. I so, don't get that. I, I thought we had a line. What, what do you well, mean we get a pipe? It's a line. It's a line, but it's a line that's kind of moving as a point source. It's not, okay. it's not this wide in an east-west sense. I got it. Um, well... Can I jump in right here? I want to keep looking at, I love that color map. That's your grad student that put that together? Yeah. She did a nice job. Um, so this grant that I'm associated with, they're talking about a magmatic 
Uh, a collapse of a magmatic... Oh, shit. What does it say? Hang on. I don't watch the language, Nick. But... Uh, I'm sorry, Basil. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Patrick. Magmatic arcs. And they're talking about the collapse of the magmatic arc. They're talking about the North Cascades. Now, that's a totally different animal than, than what we're looking at with, your, with uh, Nelson's beautiful image here. Yeah. This is, this is a, it's a completely different animal. Because remember, the coast plutonic complex and the Cascades are the, sort of the southern end of that suite of rocks. It's right next to the coast. It still has a subduction system. Right. Right. Past that, it, it, it's anybody's guess. The Cascades are going to start at some point. Um, but this is all too far inland. And it's the wrong kind of magmas. And so that's what Alan was saying in this paper, is we assume these are arcs. But if that's true, they're kind of weird in terms of what their compositions are. But also, you have to have an arc out here and an arc in here, and that doesn't make much sense. Right? How so, many... so, so neither of them are arcs? Neither I, of them are from subduction? No, I think the, I think the Cascades, the Cascade arc, and what's going on in the North Cascades is an arc. I think that stuff is legitimate, true arc, right? You're close to the margin, so that's all good. But the point is the interior is doing something else. I got to stop you. I got to stop you. That, this is one of the biggest moments maybe of the series. I had it in my head that the North Cascades... Eocene magmas were not a subduction story because we're subducting a spreading ridge. Because we have a slab window, that's not, that's not subduction. And, and, that, and I was lumping, this is my mistake, I guess, quote unquote, that I was lumping our Eocene magmas in the North Cascades with all the rest of them and saying that everything is not subduction. But you're making a distinction here that you think in the North Cascades or your, your model suggests that, that our magmas really are subduction. Even in the Eocene, we've got subduction here in the North Cascades. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to let the Dream Team sort this out. I am not in <laughs> the North Cascades. So it, it is, there's, there are magmas that look like these spreading center magmas, right? The, so when, because we have those in California, these triple junction um, magmas for when you're opening a window. There's no doubt that those are there. Mm -hmm. For sure those are there. Right? The question is how far in do they go? Right? And if you think the whole thing's a suite, you kind of got a problem because you can go to South Dakota and you get 53 million year old rhyolites coming up. Right. Right? It's just like you, you can't do that. Right? That That is way too far from the coast to have like an instantaneous magma burst. And I think that's what Alan's point is part is like slow down, make sure we really get what these okay. different magmas are doing. Right? Because they're we I mean some of these are really weird in composition. Like the ones out and I, I, I would go out with the petrologist he was like, oh, I don't like these. And I'm like, oh they're they're beautiful. They're rhyolites, whatever. He's like they're weird compositions. Well um, that's what I hear from Mike Eddy. Like the golden horn is like one of the weirdest magmas ever, apparently. It's like this can't be just a normal story. So again, I'm I I'm kind of lumping all these weird magmas together, but it's dawning me now that you're you're leading towards some sort of plate tectonic mechanism for uh well you have a few more slides, I'll bet. Yes. Well so I again I don't know what's going on. Right. And that's, you know, that's <laughs> that's the ignorance that attracts us all. <laughs> and so I'm just trying to, like, figure it out. Right. And so you know, other people have noticed the trend before. Um, yeah. This is Gene Humphreys. And Gene also, um, again, based on work of, of petrologists and geochronologists, noticed this work. So he basically says, OK, well, look, it's got to be the feral on slab because everything's the feral on slab. And so if you take a cross section from Mexico to Canada, what, what might be happening here is that the slab is breaking off. This is called the taco model, 
where the Farallon Slab basically rolls back from north and it rolls back from the south and then has to break off on the west in order to get the Cascade Arc. So it's crazy, right? You've got to do some gymnastics with these um, yeah. labs. Yeah. But, but what's good about it is it's a model, and we all have models, and we're all just trying to figure it out. And yeah. it does explain the data, right? It, it explains a, nor, a north to south younging of magmatism. Hmm. But, not much, but the problem is it's also extending in the crust, right? So it's mm -hmm. sort of a package deal again. So the way I've been thinking about this is a little bit more like this. So now I've taken this map. And so now Ooh. this is kind of a time transgressive model. So now I made north on the left side, and I've done that so that it can kind of basically play out. And we Got know it. where it's high is where it collapses, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, if it goes high, that's where you're going to pull it down. And we think that this was a continu relatively continuous. So for instance, if we, if we step back at like 40, 40 million years ago, Basically, Idaho is over at that point. It has already extended. It was high, but it's now low. Huh. And the crust is also probably, it's probably thick, but it's not, you know, it's just normal thickness. There is an area to the south where it is both extending and collapsing. And then you have, as you go further south, you've got a place where the, there's plateau with magmatism, but the extension hasn't quite started. It's not exactly clear. It looks like to my reading in the literature, the magnetism seems to start just a little bit before the extension goes. Before, okay. Yeah, just a little before. And then you have an extended plateau sort of down in for southern Nevada. So the idea might be that it's actually a lithospheric root and that you're just like, so basically the, you smashed it together, the crust went up, but the mantle lithosphere below it thickened, and then that mantle lithosphere is pulling off. Hmm. So that could be one of the ways that um, you do this. Again, they're models. And yeah. just, I mean, and again, I'm just sharing the model to say this is sort of works in progress. This is what we're trying to figure out. Yeah. And if and this is. You, you, you're mentioning extension a fair amount. So are we visualizing metamorphic core complexes each time you say the word extension in this, in this story? Or is it just a bunch of brittle normal faults or both? That's a great question. So what seems to happen is when you have magmatism associated with it, or if it's particularly high, you break into this core complex form of extension. And then the basin range doesn't start till 19, 18 million years ago. And that happens because the Pacific plate grabs Western California and yanks it mostly north, but a little bit out huh. too. So we know when that happens. Okay. There's not much magmatism and it doesn't look like there's much core complex type deformation in northern Nevada associated with the basin and range extension. It looks like it, it's, ba it's core complex early in this Eocene, Oligocene period, and then it's basin and range afterwards. So, in the whole province. Uh, it's almost 20 after the top of the hour. Live viewers, we still have more than 900 here, Basil, and I'm grateful to every one of you who are still with us. We're gonna to come to your live questions, but we're gonna do five more minutes with Basil because I know he has at least one more. Do I? Um, I think you do. Don't we have some major uh, reorganization offshore? Oh, right. I actually could pull that one in. So, right, at this point, Time, what happens at 60 to 50, uh, maybe this is worth showing this. Okay, this is way too much, I know. But <laughs> this is from a paper by Mueller et al. They do models of this, and they have different times in the Earth's past when things have changed radically in terms of plate motion. And this time four is exactly when the Eocene takes off. Wow. And, okay, so remember at 100, or, you know, early, what we said early was, was caused by subduction zones shutting off along Antarctica. This yeah. one, this one is due to, like, what's going on in the Philippine Sea Plate in New Guinea. Because, <laughs> because anything goes, right? What you have to do is shut down or modify major subduction systems. And if you do that, then you torque all the plates in the Pacific, and then they all kind of rearrange themselves. 
So we're pretty sure that right at this time, at 55, you're starting to get a major plate motion shift. And that that plate motion shift is, is likely the cause. Because everything else, right, it's not just Idaho at 55, it's Utah. It's, it's basically yeah. the entire severe thrust front. All those thrusts stop moving. This is Kurt Constantius's work, both that paper and a, and a later one. And then those thrusts fall back down, starting at about 55. So it's, there really is something everywhere. There's a, clearly a plate motion change at 55. And that also seems to be seen in like Alaska, that that seems to be a pretty robust one. There's a major change. So, and then, so this is the thing is you're dealing with this global picture or at least a pan Pacific picture. And then you have to figure out your little picture of like regionally what's going on with the North Cascades, what's going on with Celestia, Cretion, and so forth. Cause there's no doubt that is having an effect. The question though is, you know, what's, what's that small effect or regional effect doing in sort of this broader worldwide plate motion change. So using your broad worldwide view and a, a potential significant plate reorganization 55 million years ago in at least the eastern part of the Pacific Basin, is it possible some local strike slip faults that are older than 55 million years old were doing something completely differently and then they're changing to their right lateral motion. I'm just thinking in North Cascades, like, and we don't have much information about when the offset started on the Ross Lake fault zone, let's say. I know you're not a North Cascades expert, but like, yeah, so is it, is it reasonable to think there's a, there's a uh, like, like the Lewis and Crest and some of these others, that there's a, an about face on those structures? It's possible. What seems though is that it seems more that they're, they're more shutting off at sort of the level of the North Cascades at that point rather than turning on. The paleomag also backs that up, that the paleomag has the insular terrain basically in place by 50 million years. So there's, so there's no reason for them to move north. So in a way, they're stopping moving. Now, that's not true of things that are off for, offshore, like Chugash just takes off, right? And all of that stuff takes off towards the north. And Daryl, Daryl Cowan talked a little bit about that. So the yak attack and so forth, yeah. right? All of that stuff. So stuff on the margin keeps moving north. But the inland strike slip huh. seems to end more or less um, at this time. It seems like some of it might be um, facilitating some of the uh, shoe, shoe swap or Canadian core complex. But it seems like as sort of a major deal um, for moving terrains north, it's basically over at about that point. God. Oh, this is just so great. I mean, it really is so great. And I, our viewers, oftentimes, I, I get a kick, viewers, when you say in the live chat, I'm going to have to watch this one again, you know? I'm going to watch this one three times. I think I'm going to watch this one two or three times. Are you kidding me? There's so much good stuff in here, plus these papers. And again, the goal is to try to make progress in understanding the North Cascades. And it, it is so helpful to be this wide on occasion. If we're this wide the entire series, it's, it's, it's too much. But occasionally, it's important to zoom out. Um, can I go to the live viewers, or do you want to add anything else, Basil? No, let's do that. Is it OK? I'll okay. get off this so yeah, I can please. see yeah. somebody. <laughs> I'm glad you struggled with the rebooting or everything. That, that was just so great to have that. And, and uh, again, warning viewers, the, many of those really sexy diagrams are not going to show up in the papers for today. Uh, but the, the themes are there, and we'll continue to work on it. Oh, good God, you're frozen now. If you, that's quite a nice shot of you, by the way. Oh, there you are. You're back live. Thank you. God, you didn't need a new computer. Should I phone the... the Governor of Wisconsin, offer him some cheese or something? It's, it's all good. OK. Uh, uppercase, please. And I will do my best to grab a few questions. Uh, Chris asks, Basil, can you please tie this together with the Blue Mountains of northeastern Oregon? Sure. So the Blue Mountains are weird because they, they, they move into place. We know they collide. 
People argue 150, 125. They're certainly there by 125. They're affected by the Western Idaho shear zone. And then they don't do much. And that's the crazy thing. When you look at how much erosion has happened in the Blue Mountains, almost nothing. They've, they're basically just sitting there. And I think with the rotation story, they do rotate. And Bernie Hausen has some nice data from the Mitchell area on some sediments. Um, and he worked with Kathy Surplus and uh, Becky Dorsey on those. And, they sh and they've shown that they also were rotating. The Quarno um, are rotating after 45. So we know they're rotating, but really they're not doing much. Keegan Schmitz documented a couple faults that cut through them, right? Lateral faults, the lime kiln and Mount Idaho structures that go into the Blue Mountains. But for the most part, they don't go up until Basin and Range. And then <laughs> the Basin and Range happens, and it's another story. Well, that's interesting because I think we have plenty of Oregon viewers and occasionally they'll kind of say, well, what about Oregon? Why, why are you kind of ignoring Oregon? And I, I, I always kind of thought in part because it's a German chocolate cake and part because it's a basin and range and that's too young. And I guess I'm hearing from your answer right there as well that it, it, it's, the Eocene is not a, a super sexy time in Oregon, I guess. Yeah, it, well, to be clear, Eastern Oregon. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All yeah. heck's going on. <laughs> yeah. Oregon, right? You're treating the right. sea of terrain. You've got a Cascade Arc starting up. That. So, yeah, there's a lot going on okay. over there. But in eastern Oregon, it seems to be kind of protected. It seems mm -hmm. to be it has shoved itself in. Um, yeah, I don't know how much more to go into that. Eastern oh, Oregon is rotating, though. So here, I'm going to do the 706 line in Idaho. The Blue yeah. Mountains are in here. This is Orofino. Yeah. Right in you're there. Backwards. You're backwards, by the way. I don't know. Okay. If, can, can you? There you go. <laughs> this is it. And so what yeah. happens with the Blue Mountains is that they're actually flipping out. They're basically mm -hmm. rotating, and they're rotating about Orofino because that's the Precambrian, Precambrian boundary. So they're kind of stuck in that corner. That's why the not much is going on. So they're rotating out. So that's why you get this big snake. Well, you the Snake River goes through Hell's Canyon, which is basically coming apart, which is why it is. And then this pulling out is basically knocking the Yakima folded thrust belt together. He's a pinball wizard, everybody. Right. We talked about that on the earlier one. Spreading Ridge John asks, is Basil's 55 million year old plate motion shift the Emperor Pacific Southeast rotation? That's a great question. Um, I think that's a 44 million year bend. So in that case, the answer is no. So. Okay. Uh, Tim Pate, how does Celestia fit into the picture 50 million years ago? Yeah, I'll run with that. So uh, you've been watching these, Basil. So thank you, first of all. You're such a busy guy and you're so involved in so many things, but you've been a regular watcher. Um, what have you learned about the Celestia story in the in this winter from our guests to um, fit into your worldview, as you say? Well, Celestia, I mean, again, I didn't know that much about Celestia. It's certainly, it's a major player on the coast. Um, yeah. It's, to me, it's always seemed like Celestia filled the gap. That, mm. right? So the basically, to, to you, you've got the Klamaths, you've got the things in California, and the insular moved, and so did the intermontane, and you basically do this, and so you open this gap. And so Celestia just kind of finds its way and pop pops in. And so it causes deformation, certainly while it's doing that, but it's kind of got somewhere to go, um, somewhere to fill in. So that's why I think it's sort of filling in while the extension is going on. The extension probably would have been more severe even that's probably a bad word. It would be more extensive <laughs> if there had not been a kind of a Celestia coming in. But the the whole right the whole rotation story with Celestia makes total sense with the margin at this time. Um, it holds together really well as a story. But the effects seem to be more local to the coastal regions of Oregon and Washington State. Doing great. You got time for three more, Basil? You bet. Thanks. Backcountry, Gary. 
asks, is the owl, otherwise known as the Olympic Wallawa lineament, possibly a buried relative of the Lewis and Clark line? I've, I've thought a little bit about that from time to time. There, it's really hard to pin an actual structure. There's no doubt there's a lineament through there, but it's really hard to see what feature it would be. It would make sense, right, that you could have more than one of the um, features like that. But to my knowledge, the answer is no. It's not, it's not so clearly related. I'll try my own here. And viewers, I'll promise to come back for two more of yours. Uh, the work I have done with uh, Bob Miller and, and Mike Eddy to this point, they're pretty careful to say it's pretty easy to pin down the death of a strike slip fault or a lineament with major offset on it, but it's much harder to document the beginning of those two uh, sides of the fault shifting. Is that a problem with the Lewis and Clark and some of these other lines as well? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, that, that is the classic problem of, of how to do that. Um, and especially with something with the Lewis and Clark line that's moving one way at one time and yeah. one other way at the other time. And it looks like the far, so the Lewis and Clark kinds of structures actually go well into like central and even eastern Montana. And there they don't look like they're overprinted. So they look like they're only left lateral, right? And that makes sense because the only way, reason you need right lateral is, to, is basically to connect the spreading centers. So it makes sense that you abandon that. But if yeah. you abandon that, right, what happens is you leave, like all of a sudden there's pressure because of this pinball coming in, but all of a sudden you leave that pressure off. And I think that's why the 55 magnetism spreads out along the Lewis and Clark line, basically, because you're no, you've, you've thickened it because you were rotating this in, but then you stop. And in fact, you huh. go the other way. And so, you know, that's what, if you look at the trend, the 50 to 55 trend, it is, close to, not exactly on, but it's awful close to the Lewis and Clark line, if it's following that trend. Great stuff. Um, oh, Papa Gino. So when you were rebooting, I kind of revisited the question, how much bigger do you think Insular was than Celestia slash Yakutat. Is there, have you seen anybody try to quantify the mass and the acreage north, south, east, west? Nope, I have not seen that. Insular is way bigger. I mean, <laughs> right, on the sort of 20 times or more bigger. The other thing about Insular, you need to remember, it's more buoyant, right? It's Parts of it are made of granitic magmas, and they do not like to go down subduction zones. Um, whereas Celestia is a lot of Flood basalts, right? Not all, not all of um, insular terrain is flood basalts. There's some there as well, mm. um, but but there's some buoyant material. Where Celestia is really coming from the Pacific Basin, it is pretty um, oceanic, as I understand it, in that sense. Well, it is, but I'm surprised. I, I, I kind of viewed it the other way that because Celestia is so warm and so new that it's it's more buoyant it doesn't want to subduct because you're, you're trying and I, I view it insular as this cold far traveled thing that's super complicated but i just imagine it being way thicker and way colder and easier to subduct but you're saying it's more buoyant insular is more buoyant anything that's got granite is going to be more buoyant right so i mean you know you subduct basically brand new oceanic crust you don't subduct thick portions of it though and that's that's the question i see is, I see. is how thick does it have to be but the point is it didn't it found a place it found a home right oregon's happy to have it it's all good <laughs> well yeah that columbia embayment okay i i, I got to revisit that so even if you're no, this is a, a look ahead to next winter i guess with baja bc but the end of baja bc movement is 55 million years ago and I think you just said that if you do Baja BC movement, you're left with a hole, the Columbia embayment, and there's a pocket to, to shove Celestia into. But if you're not a wild Baja BC enthusiast, are you still imagining the Columbia embayment? Or is the Columbia embayment only a Baja BC? Uh, no. It, you tie those things together. No, it's a, it's a well, 
first of all, it's a real thing, right? There's just this lack of Mesozoic rock. There's geophysical properties that say there's just, it's really hard to find a basement that looks like any of the basement that are surrounding it to the east, north, or south. So it's okay. a real phenomenon. Yeah. The second issue is you don't have to believe in Baja ABC to just restore the known faults, right? Yeah. There are piercing fair faults with known piercing points. Sandra Wilde and colleagues did that. And there's no way around it. The insular terrain restores the northernmost California, right? And that's exactly the space you want open. So, it, you know, you can, you can be a, you have to be a mobilist to at least that extent. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but again, Baja BC is not just the insular, but it's also, the intermontane is also, from paleomagnetic data, a thousand kilometers north of where it should be. So really, the intermontane is probably what filled the Columbia Bayman proper, and it has also moved north. You see what I mean? You always come up with a wrinkle there. I think I've got it, and now you just <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, it's, it's, it all goes north. <laughs> I love it. Uh, last one, and I promise I'm done. All those dikes, all those northeast, southwest trending dikes, all across the Pacific Northwest into Montana, uh, do you tie all those in your model to the accretion of Silesia? Um, that is a really tough question. In Idaho, there's a lot of trends that are going that way because it's the old um, boundary between Archean. Like, so this trans, uh, there's, a, there's basically a zone that goes right across Idaho that separates Archean from Proterozoic. It's a known discontinuity. It is exactly that orientation. Mm. So it, is it a pre-existing feature? I don't know. Right. Um, right. The other problem, though, is remember these core complexes are going like gangbusters, right? And the uh, and the uh, there's also an ex an elongation direction on them that's not right. If if you th that's almost parallel to the strike, which means orthogonal to the opening direction. So in round in basically round, it's not quite east west, but basically the core complexes are opening east west. East the, west. That we, you know that, and that's you know what's going on at fifty-five, and it dribbles on to about forty. In fact, the, 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 they're more or less parallel to the Lewis and Clark line, right? Hmm. So they're like this, right? They're trying to extend, and then you've got these dikes coming in like this, and and recording that. I, I might be doing this flip thing because no, of I got you though. No, so the turtle, the turtle's head is north. The turtle shell is there. It's it's truly east-west extension, opening the elevator doors on these metamorphic core complexes regionally. And yet, and, then, and, and yet, yet there's doubt there's dikes coming in at a different orientation. And the dikes, uh, I never thought about that till right now. Are the are the northeast trending dikes cutting through turtle shells and also sandboxes between turtle shells? Are, are they know. everywhere? I don't know the answer to that because I've not worked in the bitter roots. And I, so that is a great question. And I don't know what the relationship of the dikes to the, to the core complexes are, right? That's a great question. So um, you can ask that to Bob Miller. I, I got, that's another reason I'm gonna rewatch this show. When I rewatch the show the fourth time, I'm gonna get my little legal pad and I'm gonna just, okay, I got a whole list. Maybe that's all we do on Saturday as I just go through my list from the Basil show and. We'll know if, who knows if they watched it or not, but we'll... Uh, yeah, it might take stage the whole time to, like, reprogram. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, This is my acknowledgement. The North Cascades, not my thing. So They're not your thing, but everything else apparently is, and <laughs> it, it's just so wonderful. And I, I, I can't thank you enough, not only for your three appearances here, but uh, going back a few years... Uh, with, with all of your help. So your generosity with me is great, and I'm sure you're generous with so many other people too. So thank you, Basil, so much. My pleasure, absolutely. This has been great okay. fun. Learned a lot. Great. All right, well, we'll see you next winter maybe, if not before, how about that? Sounds great, see you everybody. Okay, bye-bye.
Dr. Basil Tikoff. I got to pronounce his name more accurately. From this point on, let it be known, Patrick. It's Dr. Basil Tikoff. There. I won't say Tikoff again. Tikoff. University of Wisconsin, Madison. He's been there a long time. Well respected geologist. Such a thrill to have him with us again this time. Here's a look back to our three magmatic flare ups in the North Cascades before Christmas. And we will be disciplined the next time I see you, which will be Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific for session Z. And we will be only in the North Cascades, almost sure. And I really will be taking ideas, stray thoughts, clear ideas of basils, fuzzy ideas of basils, bounce them off of our three North Cascades geologists and see what we can do with those things. And some of it may be extremely helpful, not only with me comprehending what's going on, but possibly uh, the direction of the work in the next few years. That's always the hope. I'll say one general thing before we sign off. From Aaron Donaghy's email to Basil texting me on a Sunday night about ideas that he has, etc. I don't know if it's clear to you, but for some of the geologists, not all, but for some of the geologists, it just becomes part of who you are. It's not a work slash free time kind of a thing. And so the field trips or the camping together or the long conversations on the phone talking about geology, it's, it's never really viewed as work. And somebody like Erin Donaghy, who's finishing up her PhD in the next few years, I have every hope in the world that she will spend her full career in the North Cascades. Who knows what, who knows what the future is, but um, you know, there's people in different stages of their career but the point is, you just cross this, I don't know how to say it. I'll try just quickly before we sign off. For me, and I think for most who get into geology beyond a bachelor's degree, there's some sort of weird magical threshold that you cross over. And suddenly, you're not spending time preparing for a test so that you can take your grades back to your parents. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it just because it's fascinating. I don't know if you caught Jerome's comment last show, but I think I said something like, well, you're really well read, Jerome, and you're up on all the latest work, and you must feel like, I forget what I said, something like, you must feel like that's your obligation as a professor. And he said, well, yeah, but it's also really fascinating. <laughs> it's just fun stuff to think about. And so this, this line of demarcation between work and uh, personal life, for many of us, there is no line of demarcation. And I don't know what other fields are like. I don't know what other careers are like. But some of these folks have been able to take a mastery of discipline and technique and reading comprehension and rigor in science but they, they are also just living their life. And it's all part of the same experience. Weird way to end. A toast to you. Here's to you for joining us today. Thank you for your interest. Here's to Dr. Basil Tickoff from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you, Basil, for another excellent appearance.
Here's to the health of your family and friends. Zun Heit. And here's to this time that we have together. We've been doing it twice a week, the whole winter, and there's one more show. This coming Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific time, I hope you can join us. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye. From Ellensburg, Washington, USA. See you Saturday.